Hello and welcome. I'm Fernando, a GP in the UK. Today, we will go through a number of nice publications on insomnia, including guidance on CBT for insomnia, and the prescribing of hypnotics, diridorexant and melatonin, all of them from a primary care perspective. I have added timestamps to this video so that you can easily skip to the chapters that you're interested in. Because they're probably the most used resource when treating insomnia, we will spend much of the video focusing on the prescribing of hypnotics, in particular the Z drugs such as Solpidem and Sopiclone. By the way, make sure that you stay for the entire episode, because at the end I will go through some audit ideas packed by NICE, which you could use as a quality improvement project in your practice. So let's jump into it. Let's talk a little about the condition first. Insomnia is a disturbance of sleep characterized by difficulty in initiating and or maintaining sleep. However, insomnia is highly subjective and although most healthy adults typically sleep between 7 and 9 hours per night, patterns vary between people and in any given person there are also variations from night to night. Estimates of the prevalence of insomnia vary and while up to 48% of people have reported sleeping issues, only 6% met the criteria for a diagnosis of insomnia. So in general practice, differentiating between simple sleeping problems and significant insomnia is important before considering treatment. The prevalence of insomnia is higher in women and increases with age, and although the majority do not seek medical advice, the treatment depends on the duration and nature of the symptoms. Appropriate management of comorbidities may help and sleep hygiene advice is fundamental, for example, avoiding stimulants and maintaining regular sleeping hours with a suitable environment for sleep. Other non-pharmacological interventions, for example CBT, are also effective. Insomnia can have a number of different causes. Primary insomnia can be differentiated from insomnia associated with factors such as personal circumstances, physical or psychiatric comorbidities, concomitant drug treatments or substance abuse. Epidemiology surveys have shown that over half of people with sleep problems have either a mental or physical health problem. And in this video we will not be talking about specific issues caused by physical conditions such as sleep apnea or narcolepsy or sleep disturbances associated to severe mental illness. For the management, it is crucial to differentiate between short-term insomnia and long-term insomnia. For short-term insomnia, sleep hygiene advice is offered. After this, medicines such as Sopiclone, Solpiden and Melatonin can be used for a short time, that is, less than 4 weeks or less than 13 weeks for melatonin. In addition, up to 40% of people with insomnia self-medicate with over-the-counter drugs for example, sedative antihistamines. However, long-term insomnia, also known as chronic insomnia, is different and is defined as dissatisfaction with quantity or quality of sleep for three nights or more per week for at least three months with an effect on daytime functioning. Therefore, long-term insomnia has both nighttime and daytime symptoms. Furthermore, once insomnia has lasted for more than six months, it may last for years and be difficult to resolve. For long-term insomnia, sleep hygiene advice is given first, and then CBT for insomnia is the recommended first-line treatment. But there are access difficulty to CBT for insomnia across the country, and in many areas access is poor. And this is a real pity, because CBT for insomnia has 70-80% to 80 response rate and roughly 50% experience long-term remission. NICE has published 17 products on insomnia, but the majority are for sleep apnea and narcolepsy. Only four would be relevant for this video, and these are the medical technology Sleepio, advice on hypnotics like benzodiazepines and Zen drugs such as Solpidem and Sopiclone, recommendations on Daridorexant, and finally we will also briefly touch on melatonin. Sleepio is a digital self-help program that includes CBT for insomnia and that reduces symptoms compared with sleep hygiene and sleeping tablets. The gold standard treatment for insomnia is face-to-face -face CBT for insomnia, but its availability is very limited and therefore Sleepio is recommended as an alternative to sleeping tablets. 
Unfortunately, Sleepio is not available on the NHS in all regions of the UK either. Let's now have a look at the recommendations on hypnotics like benzodiazepines and said drugs such as solpidem and sopiclaurin. They can be considered after sleep hygiene, but for a short time only, and bearing in mind that they do not treat underlying causes. A number of hypnotic agents are licensed for the treatment of insomnia, including benzodiazepines and said drugs. Benzodiazepines enhance the effects of GABA, which is the major inhibitory neurotransmitter in the central nervous system. Examples licensed for insomnia are, amongst others, nitrosepam, temazepam and lorazepam. The effects of benzodiazepines are dependent upon the dose administered and the pharmacokinetic profile. The BNF refers to temazepam and lorazepam as having a shorter duration of action. Benzodiazepines with a longer half-life, like diazepam and nitrosepam, tend to have prolonged effects the next day. The main concern with benzodiazepines is that many people develop tolerance to their effects, gain little benefits from chronic use, become both physically and psychologically dependent on them, and suffer withdrawal symptoms when trying to stop them. Rebound insomnia also occurs and is characterized by worsening insomnia upon stopping the tablets. The use of benzodiazepines for the treatment of insomnia should be restricted to severe insomnia and treatment should not be continued beyond four weeks. Solpidem and Sopiclone, the said drugs, are non-benzodiazepine hypnotics. Although the said drugs differ structurally from benzodiazepines, they are also agonists of the GABA receptor complex and therefore enhance GABA-mediated neuronal inhibition. Solpidem has a half-life of 2.5 hours and sopiclone of between 3.5 and 6.5 hours. They are licensed for the short-term treatment of insomnia in situations where the insomnia is debilitating or is causing severe distress for the patient. The duration of treatment is a maximum of four weeks, including tapering off where appropriate. Although they said drugs were developed to overcome the disadvantages of benzodiazepines, the sedative effects of the said drugs may also persist into the next day and they can cause tolerance, dependence and withdrawal symptoms. It may be worth mentioning that a review of the trial evidence comparing the said drugs with benzodiazepines licensed for insomnia showed in summary that there were no clinically useful differences between the drugs. Because of the lack of evidence to distinguish between solpidem and sopiclone, the drug with the lowest purchase cost should be prescribed, and switching from one to another should only occur if a patient experiences adverse effects considered to be directly related to a specific agent. Patients who have not responded to one of these hypnotic drugs should not be prescribed any of the others. So we have now seen that short-term insomnia can be treated with sleep hygiene and short-term use of hypnotics, and long-term insomnia with sleep hygiene and either face-to-face -face CBT for insomnia or digital CBT for insomnia like Sleepio. But what does NICE recommend for long-term insomnia if CBT for insomnia or Sleepio have not worked or are not available? And this is where we find the latest NICE guidance on this issue, published in October 2023. It refers to a new type of drug, Daridorexant. And NICE says that Daridorexant is both clinically and cost-effective, and it is recommended for long-term insomnia, that is insomnia lasting for three nights or more per week for at least three months with affected daytime functioning. But only if CBD for insomnia is ineffective or it is not available or is unsuitable. What is daridorexant? Well, daridorexant is now available on the BNF and unlike benzodiazepines and same drugs, which work by increasing sedation, daridorexant is a new type of drug, anorexing antagonist which works in a different way. It inhibits arousal mechanisms. To understand this, we need to know that orexins are neuropeptides produced by the hypothalamus, which promote a state of wakefulness. Therefore, diridorexant, by blocking the orexin receptors, reduces wakefulness and helps sleep. Because of the different mechanism of action, if necessary, diridorexant could be used at the same time as other medicines or non-medicine treatments available for insomnia. And the good news is that in clinical studies there has been no evidence of abuse or withdrawal symptoms 
indicative of physical dependence. NICE recommends that the length of treatment should be as short as possible and the treatment should be reviewed within three months of starting and at regular intervals thereafter. But it can be used as maintenance treatment for managing longer-term symptoms if necessary. Now let's touch on the prescribing of melatonin for insomnia. Melatonin is a hormone that occurs naturally in the body. It is involved in regulating sleep and circadian rhythms and it can be given as an oral medication to treat sleeping problems. There is little nice guidance on the use of melatonin. There is only an evidence summary on the use of melatonin for treating sleep disorders in adults who are blind. And because of insufficient evidence, NICE was unable to determine its clinical effectiveness and safety. The BNF states that melatonin is indicated as short-term treatment for insomnia in adults over 55 years of age for up to 13 weeks, as short-term treatment for jet lag in adults for up to 5 days, and as treatment for insomnia in patients with learning disabilities and challenging behaviour, although this use is unlicensed and it needs to be initiated under specialist supervision. Cautions for melatonin include autoimmune disease, as exacerbations have been reported, and susceptibility to seizures as there is a risk of increased seizure frequency. Reported side effects of melatonin are, amongst others, arthralgia, increased risk of infection, drowsiness, headaches and pain. Now, as promised, let's have a look at audit ideas on the use of hypnotics, including said drugs, suggested by NICE, and that you could use for a quality improvement project in your practice. The objectives for the audit would be to assess the appropriateness of use of solpidem and sopiclone. The patients to be included in the audit could be, for example, all those for whom solpidem or sopiclone are prescribed for a suitable period of time, for example, three to six months. Possible audit criteria could be the following four. Criterion 1. Non-pharmacological measures are considered before prescribing. The standard for this criterion would be 100% of all patients without exception. Criterion 2 could be when prescribed, hypnotic drug therapy is prescribed for a short period of time only, in strict accordance with the licensed indications. And the standard for this criterion would also be 100% of all patients without exception. Criterion 3 could be when prescribed, the hypnotic drug with the lowest cost is chosen. The standard would be 100% of all patients with the exception of those who have developed side effects with a cheaper first-line agent. And criterion 4 would be a patient is switched from one hypnotic drug to another. As switching is not recommended, the standard would be 0% of all patients with the exception of those who have developed side effects considered to be directly related to a specific agent. Once compliance has been calculated, the practice can identify whether clinical management can be improved, agree on a plan and repeat the measurements after a period of time to close the audit cycle and to confirm that the desired improvement has been achieved. And there you have it, a simple project to fulfill your QIP requirements for appraisal. We have come to the end of this episode. Remember that this is not medical advice and it is only my summary and my interpretation of the guideline. You must always use your clinical judgment. Thank you for watching and goodbye.